I don't think the 200 megapixels are really that much of an upgrade. All right, here's the deal. This video was just gonna be a simple test, but it turned into something of a saga. It's still just a simple test. We're only gonna compare one photo subject against a couple different phones, but the journey of getting those samples was a bit more complex than I expected. If you just wanna skip to the photo comparisons, that time code is down in the description below. I do wanna kind of explain part of the process though. First, because this is YouTube and we always must appease the popularity algorithm, the Galaxy Note 23 is one of the best phone camera systems of the year and might be the best overall phone camera system sold directly in North America. Apparently I have to really spell that out for the super diehard Samsung fans or there's much gnashing of teeth down in my comments. And I can't mix that in with just a little bit of nuance. They need to hear that directly up front. Never gets old having to appease the Samsung Knights. Okay, little Samsung fan, airplane in the hangar. But that shouldn't come as a shock, right? This is one of the most expensive phones sold in North America and bestestest platform isn't what we're testing here in this video. We're drilling down to a very specific claim made by Samsung and a feature on the phone that seems more built for marketing than for actual practical use. 200 megapixels. Wow, worthy resolution. During Samsung Unpacked, I felt that was kind of a ridiculous feature to highlight. And now that I'm testing it, my mind was totally blown. I'm totally kidding. I still think it's mostly marketing. I think it's worth taking a second to break down how we got here. Internationally, Sony is selling a new camera sensor that's an impressive increase in sensor size. Samsung wants to make their products sound more impressive every year too. So they chose a technology that looks incredible on paper. Now, from a scientific and engineering perspective, it is actually kind of impressive what they did to this main sensor. We can talk about pixels on a phone. These sensors employ a tech called pixel binning. A traditional sensor has red, green, and blue sub pixels. A pixel binning sensor takes a larger pixel and cuts it into smaller pieces. So we start with a 12 megapixel sensor. That's what all these cameras usually are, 12, 12.5, or 16 megapixels. But then we take that larger pixel and we cut it into four pieces. Now we technically have the correct number of dots to call that a 48 megapixel sensor, but it's not really a 48 megapixel sensor. The RGBs don't really line up the way they would need to for a finished picture. So it takes a bit of software magic to reorganize those blocks of dots. Sometimes in your photo data, you can see a mention of demosaicing or remosaicing. Software has to rearrange these subpixels and that can impact photo quality if we were to compare that against a true RGB 48 megapixel sensor. We can use this to get more detail in a shot, but it's always going to have a bit of that software processed look. The real advantage to pixel binning, in my not so humble opinion, is improving HDR performance. Each tiny subpixel can capture a different exposure value. Half of your red dots can capture a brighter value and half of your red dots can capture a darker value. And when that's all merged back into a bigger pixel, we get more dynamic range in our 12 megapixel image. But we almost always come back to that binned resolution. That combined resolution is where we get the biggest photo sites. And when we see the overall grid of binned pixels, that's where we have a traditional RGB layout. Back to Samsung, they've been on a crazy arms race increasing the number of tiny subpixels on their sensors. We went from quad bear to non cell so each pixel was cut in a 2x2 two two grid, then it was cut into a 3x3 three three grid, and now on the Note 23, it's a 4x4 four four grid. Each standard pixel is cut into 16. 16 individual pieces. Samsung has not made the sensor significantly larger. They just keep making all the subpixels smaller and smaller and smaller. It's my assertion that we see radically diminishing returns when we just keep packing more tiny photo sites on the same size sensor. So this tech is impressive that they can do this, but there's never a perfect seamless implementation of adding more subpixels. The gaps between pixels requires incredibly sophisticated technology to minimize the impact of having those gaps between the subpixels. When you see Samsung talk about how impressive that technological feat is, I believe them, but those were challenges born of their desire 
to make a big marketing number. They had to employ more expensive manufacturing to overcome the issues inherent to cutting pixels into smaller and smaller and smaller little pieces. Which is why I think this is kind of a silly claim. Even with some impressive engineering, we need to see if the lens on this camera really can resolve that much optical information. I mean, there's a reason we don't often see hundreds of megapixels on standalone mirrorless cameras, and those lenses are significantly higher quality than the best of our phone lenses. I don't think you can literally see that much information through a phone lens, even if the sensor is saving that much information in a photo, <laughs> which is where we finally get to the test setup. <laughs> Now, I wanted something simple and easily replicated. I think we get in trouble as reviewers when we make claims about image quality improvements, but we're shooting really casually in outdoor locations. The tiny differences in composition, tiny differences in where and how you focus, the small changes in the scene, like if the wind is blowing, can all add up to significant differences in comparative photo output. And that's only if we believe that the exact same care was used for every comparison photo in a YouTuber video. And there aren't many YouTubers, I honestly believe, put in that much care. So let's eliminate a few of those variables. Shooting in my office, mounting phones to tripods, using the exact same lighting, measuring the distance to the subject. I'm using a stuffed animal that can mostly hold perfectly still. And we're aiming for one specific tiny landmark on the pup's eyebrow. We've got a furry texture to look at for details, and I think a fair number of folks out there will care about how their phones might take pictures of their pets. There's one specific seam right here. Now, using my Panasonic with a macro lens, this is the landmark we're looking at, a tiny braided stitch. And this is what it looks like in scientifically close-up detail from a very expensive combination of camera, sensor, and lens. Samsung's claim of 200 megapixel sensor is that you get so much more detail for cropping. That means we should see more information than a phone using a lower resolution sensor, right? My main competitor for the Note 23 is the Vivo X90 Pro. It's my hypothesis that a larger sensor will deliver equal to or better pixel level detail for using larger overall pixels. And I've really fallen in love with the optical quality of shooting on these one inch type sensors. But I also wanted to keep this fair and I also shot with a Vivo X80 Pro. And this has a similar sensor size to the Note 23, but at one quarter the sub pixel resolution. We can see how this year's Note stacks up against one of the best photography solutions from last year. I really wanted to use the Pixel 7 Pro in this test, which also has a similar sized main camera, but Google does not provide a high resolution mode, even though they advertise a 50 megapixel sensor. I find that irksome. I'm really not a fan of that marketing number when we can shoot a full resolution shot, but I definitely don't think you should advertise that when you can't shoot full res. Moving on, getting to some of the samples, the Samsung camera app was a little frustrating to shoot with. I, I was gonna compare auto modes, manual modes, and special processed raw modes. Samsung's out of the box auto is kinda stupid. Lining up this shot, which is kinda close, but it's almost the distance you would shoot a head and shoulder portrait of a person, the Note 23 kept switching me to the ultra wide. I also am not a fan of auto macro modes in the best of conditions, but it makes no sense for it to kick on at this distance. I'm looking at the viewfinder, I like, okay, let's just go ahead and snap the photo there. This is what the Vivo put out, and this is what the Note shot. That's garbage. Imagine that's the first photo you get indoors from your brand new $1,200 phone. This feature isn't clearly defined for how busy the Samsung camera viewfinder is. I love seeing techies get real pissy when a phone uses a different kind of swipe on the notification shade. We're very upset about that consumer confusion. But then we give Samsung a pass on absolutely terrible conveyance on an important feature in the camera app. Most other phone manufacturers have some kind of flower icon to let the user know that there's a macro mode. Samsung moves a weird little dot to the bottom corner of your display and you have to know 
what this focus enhancer toggle does because it's not labeled. It's two dumb circles. Not knowing what this toggle is has a significant impact on photo quality. I do not believe we should ever talk about a note in terms of the lowest level average consumer. I expect someone spending more on a phone will at least be intellectually curious enough to play with some of the settings on their expensive phone. This is still garbage, even for the person who might dig a little deeper. But let's say, even if you were a low level average consumer, you'd get this awful output. And then you'd probably say to yourself, well, I already tried the Android that the guy with millions of subscribers said was the bestest Android. I guess I better get a iPhone because they just work. Those average consumer reviewers should be outraged about stuff like this if they were consistent in their consumer confusion outrage. Pretty obvious that Samsung videos pay the bills better. But even if you are a fairly well experienced tech user, it's different just to be different and is less clear in communicating what the camera is doing. We've almost universally adopted flower icon as the symbol for close up photo except Samsung. And no other phone saw this scene and thought, better switch to a macro shot. Only the Note did this. This is exactly the kind of software gripe we see highlighted in the reviews of non-Samsung and Apple phones, where reviewers sigh and they protest and they roll their eyes and gesture with their hands. This is so annoying software and it should just work like other phones. But demonstrating those kinds of gripes on a popular phone, those complaints just get hand waved away. Reviewers could be more consistent with their criticisms, and then we'd get better products from Samsung and Apple too. But I digress. I went a little deeper there than I meant to. So I shot a couple samples. Conclusion up front. I see very little merit to adding the extra resolution. It's, it's baked into the title of this video, but it's not bad news for Samsung fans. I think we just need to keep our expectations in check, and we definitely need to shrug off Samsung's absurd marketing. Starting with actual RAW files, not fancy processed expert super RAW, just the regular RAW files, they're all pretty close. They're all 12 megapixel DNG files, because that's really what all these sensors are. They're 12 megapixel sensors. Now remember, we're looking at the seam right here on the pup's eyebrow. And when you're not fighting the Samsung camera app, this is really good image detail for a phone raw photo. We can look at this against the control photo that I shot from my Lumix. I think we'd all say this is really good, but the raw photo from the one inch sensor, is just better. From the Vivo X90 Pro, the fur is sharper around the eye, and you see more of the braiding in the seam. Pixel level detail improves with larger overall pixels. I mentioned that I also shot a control from my Lumix. I shot this from an equivalent focal length from my Lumix G9 using a thousand dollar lens, and of course, it's better than either phone. But the one inch sensor is noticeably closer to the Panasonic. The Vivo doesn't have the same quality glass, but it does have have almost the same size bend pixel as the pixels on my Lumix. These one inch type sensors are getting really close to the sensor level performance of micro four thirds mirrorless cameras. The Note has a decently sized sensor, but it's a smaller sensor than the Vivo with smaller pixels and it's not as capable at resolving the same level of detail. But of course, Samsung's claim was resolution. 200 megapixels, crop like magic, crop like, whoa. The Vivo only shoots 50 megapixels. The Note 23 must be four times betterer. <sighs> no, I actually wrote deep sigh in my notes here. I, I just thought I'd add it to the video. Okay, so here's the deal. The Note image is bigger. It's more than double the file size. It takes up more space on your phone's storage. It's a larger image than the Vivo's, but it's a larger image with kind of the same detail. Looking at the photos, I'm at 150% crop on the Note for the same field of view as a 300% crop on the Vivo. And remember, these are all highly processed photos. Pixel binning sensors cannot put out a true one-to-one -one image with the way they cluster sub-pixels together, especially 
in blocks of 16 individual subpixels. So we get all the HDR and color processing baked in, and even with Samsung's somewhat aggressive sharpening, we're not really landing a clearer photo with more detail. The 50 megapixel sensor is landing an ever so slightly crisper shot of that tiny little braided stitch that we're looking for. Which means I could probably take that photo from the Vivo and just blow it up to 200 megapixels with fake software resolution in like Photoshop and I'd have a better photo than what the note captured if I cared about just having a bigger photo to take up more space on my hard drive. It's not just resolution, we need the lens to actually give us more clarity for that resolution to matter. But what about those expert raw and super raw photos, Juan? The Note 23 can shoot a 50 megapixel raw photo. Yeah, that's kind of a lie too. Neither Apple nor Samsung are really giving you a traditional raw photo at higher resolution. On a camera or on on a phone, we can pull the data off of the sensor before any processing, and we call that a raw photo. It's not a photo meant for distribution, it's a really large bucket of data to edit with, and we save that in a special container file called a DNG. When we get into these special modes like Pro Raw, Expert Raw, Super Raw, Raw Plus, these special modes take a stack of raw files and then smash them together and repackage all of that data as a single new DNG file, but that's an edited photo. I am a huge fan of this processing because it's kind of like shooting a bracket on a mirrorless camera. On my standalone Lumix, I have to set up a tripod, let the camera shoot five to seven individual images. Then I need to take all of those photos, pop the memory card, put them into a computer and edit them in another program. But a phone with a special raw processing mode can do all of that in the camera and it works really well even when you're going handheld. It's so much more convenient than trying to shoot a bracket from a mirrorless camera. But I think you could see now with all of that editing and processing and noise reduction filtering and sharpening, that's not really raw. 50 megapixel expert raw. It's a tiny bit sharper than the Vivo's normal raw at 12 megapixels, but I don't believe it's through significant sensor advantages. More, it just looks like Samsung bakes additional sharpening or some kind of structure filtering into the image stacking algorithm. Vivo's super raw is really conservative by comparison. It's a mode that cleans out a little noise and it bumps up the dynamic range and color it's not applying as much sharpening, it's letting you do that edit. If I take the Vivo RAW and drop it into Affinity and I move the clarity slider, I can almost recreate the sharpening effect on the Note 23's Expert RAW. And that's at like a quarter the resolution. And of course, neither of the phones match the single shot RAW produced by my Micro Four Thirds mirrorless camera with a thousand dollar lens. Pardon the interruption, but we've got to thank this video sponsor, who is you. Videos on this channel would literally not be possible without the amazing support of the folks over on patreon.com slash some gadget guy. Just an amazing crew of people that are not only supporting production on this channel, but are also contributing to conversations. They're really keeping me on my toes. A really fun community of tech pals that join the conversation and ask interesting questions that help me produce other types of videos. We never want support to feel like a burden. I personally can't financially support all of my favorite content creators. So any effort someone can make is greatly appreciated. If you're sharing videos on social media, you're subscribing and smashing bell icons. If you're posting to the appropriate subreddits, every little bit helps in helping us build a community of people that really enjoy these kinds of tech conversations. But if you have the means and you would like to contribute at a higher level, I really would appreciate you checking out the Patreon. I'm writing up production diaries, behind the scenes posts. It's where I start all of my performance testing. It's where I'm gonna be hosting all of my camera conversations and camera technical deep dives. Early access for some of my videos, top tier patrons get a copy of my photography book and the private discord, which has kind of just become my favorite place to hang out what with all of the craziness happening in social media. Once again, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. Thank you so much for everybody who makes the effort to share and support and contribute to their favorite content creators. And now let's get on to the rest of the video. If you've managed to stick around this long through the video, I feel we should be starting to learn something. It's not just resolution, optics, sensor size, and resolution 
all need to work together. Taking the same size sensor and cutting it up into smaller pieces delivers very little benefit in the way that Samsung is marketing this as an upgrade. You do get more data to crop, but you don't get to the end of that crop with a sharper image than using a camera with a bigger sensor and bigger pixels. If resolution were the only factor, then the Note's 50 megapixel mode would be two and a half times better than my Lumix G9, and the 200 megapixel mode would be 10 times better than my <laughs> mirrorless camera. But Juan, we know that mirrorless cameras are superior because they have bigger sensors and bigger lenses. Okay, yes, I believe that's accurate. So why wouldn't that hold true if we're moving up in sensor size on a phone too? We should be able to point to some of those sensor and optical improvements moving up phone camera sensors too. But earlier in this video, I did say that this wasn't all bad for the Samsung. And I did make mention of this being one of the bestest camera platforms in North America of the year. Because I believe the big improvement year over year going from the Note 22 to the Note 23 is not resolution, but lens quality. Samsung isn't quite getting to the Vivo's level, but it's getting pretty close to the fine detail performance of the best phone sensor on the market today. We're working at a sensor size deficit against Vivo and Xiaomi, and the Note 23 is getting closer than I would have imagined. Remember, I also shot this same subject from last year's Vivo. And compared to a phone from last year with a similar sized sensor as the Note, we do see some optical improvements. I love the Vivo X80 Pro. And when I tested both last year, I felt the optical performance of the Note 22 was in a similar ballpark as the Zeiss lens coatings on the X80 Pro. Samsung knows how to make a good lens. I'll still never forgive them for killing the NX line of cameras. Raw photo to raw photo, that's where we see an improvement. The lens on the X80 Pro was one of the best of 2022. The Note 23 is resolving more fine detail than the premium phones of last year. And that's why I think so many of these Note 22 versus Note 23 showdowns are showing improvements. I think it has very little to do with the sensor tech and the 200 megapixels and mostly comes down, in my not so humble opinion, to Samsung using a better lens on the Note 23. We'll never be able to prove this directly, but it's my hypothesis, if we could take the lens elements out of the Note 23 and put them in a Note 22, we'd see very similar photo performance. Photography isn't magic, it's physics. I'm sure by now, or long before now, someone has already scurried off to the comments to just vomit, regurgitate some hot take about, but average consumers just need and it just works basic and people are dumb don't use settings edit raw files Blah. i'll never understand why tech enthusiasts ever use that that's that's a terrible defense of lazy reviewing we have reviewers who make whole videos about ultra expensive phones using them in the most basic ways. For myself personally, it comes down to two points. One, I don't wanna insult my audience. I'm going to assume that if you're shopping a $1,200 phone, you're at least intellectually curious enough to wonder what that phone can really do. And you're interested in digging through a menu or two to kind of figure that stuff out. I'm going to assume you want to see what $1,200 worth of performance might look like. I'm terrifically bored of the idea that I should use a $1,200 phone the same way I might use a $400 phone. I don't understand why anyone would want to watch that video. If you're not that kind of intellectually curious, you're not watching YouTube videos about your phone anyway. And two, let's break down this average consumer market. Samsung sold roughly 260 million phones in 2022. Only about 25 million of those were Galaxy S. All of the Galaxy S phones, S22, S22 Plus, and Note 22 combined about 25 million units, depending on what analyst you listen to. S22, S22 Plus, Note 22. Less than 10% of Samsung's customer base is shopping premium, and a smaller chunk of that is shopping ultra. Why? Why are we talking about average consumers when less than 10% of the market 
is shopping at this tier. And the overwhelming number of Android consumers are shopping $400 and lower. That's our threshold for average. A Pixel 6a, a Galaxy A series, maybe some kind of fancy Poco, you're done. That's average. Spending any more than $400 means we are immediately specializing on specific features for more discerning consumers. And spending at the top of the market should mean a significantly more critical examination of not just performance, but of the manufacturer's claims. Samsung marketing? always makes the silliest claims. I promise I'm wrapping this up. We're bringing this plane in for a landing. The Note 23 is a champ. With the S Pen and Dex, it becomes the crown jewel productivity phone. It's a truck that gets work done, especially when you're managing documents and spreadsheets and trying to use it as a practical computer. Just chef's kiss, Mwah. It has a very good combination of cameras. But if you tell me you value optics and image quality and photo quality above taking notes or having a desktop mode, I have to point you to a Vivo or a Xiaomi. Those new one inch type sensors are really exciting. Conversely, if you tell me you want an easier to use camera app, reasonably close optical performance at that 12 megapixel binned resolution and a better telephoto for indoor and nighttime lighting, and you just don't want to spend $1,200 before trade-ins or sales, then I think you should get a Pixel 7 Pro. I'm not saying everyone is like me, but I take more shots of my family and friends indoors than I do trying to take photos of the moon. But I digress again. If you already own a Note 23, I'm not making this video to make you feel bad about your phone. You are not Samsung just because you own a Samsung and you shouldn't have to defend your feelings. I want you to like your phone, especially acknowledging that this is is going to be one of the best phones of the year. But I want you to really like it for what it actually does well. I don't want you to like it for the fairy tale. Samsung marketing promised you something they really aren't delivering. Samsung knows the vast majority of people who are going to buy a Note aren't also going to own five other premium tier phones, and they aren't also going to pixel peep all this stuff in a controlled setup. At the consumer level, their marketing claims largely go unchallenged. As someone who does get to play with a couple of premium and ultra tier phones throughout the year, it's my job to analyze the marketing claims and come up with some way that we can test those claims in a controlled and consistent fashion. And that's where we really need to put a pin in this. I'm going to have more to say about the Vivo X90 Pro soon, and I'll be sharing some more thoughts on the Note 23 on my Patreon, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. If I took this long to set up and analyze one set of photos, just imagine what my full camera review on the Note is going to look like. And now just thinking about that, I might have to have a have a quick cry over in the corner because that's going to be a lot of work. So as always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been absolutely fantastic. If you're uh, you know, clicking on links in the descriptions, if you're hitting my home site, somegadgetguy.com, buying a little merch, or if you're joining the list of names, scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the omniverse. I was going to say in the galaxy, but it's really bigger than that. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Twitch, spending a lot more time on the Mastodons, trying to revive a Flickr account, a Flickr account, but not so much on the Facebooks or the Instagrams. And I will catch you all on the next video.